Welcome to TEDx. This TEDx event is part of a global conversation that takes place every day in every corner of the world. In schools, in theaters, in workplaces, even in prisons, people gather to hear the best ideas bubbling up in their communities. More than 3,000 TEDx events are held every year in 170 countries. It's a remarkable thing. TEDx events are self-organized under a license from TED, a nonprofit organization devoted to discovering and sharing powerful ideas in the form of TED Talks. It's not TED itself, but your local TEDx team of volunteers that has done all the work to put on today's event, including booking all of the speakers. It's this team's ideas, dedication, and time that have made this possible. We really hope today's program sparks an exciting conversation. This is a day for curiosity and for skepticism, for inspiration and for action. The more you enter into it, the more you will take out. And now, on with the show. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Bellamy University's third annual TEDx. Yes, we are back again through another amazing year. Let me tell you about it. Uh, my name is Quincy Nelson, and I'll be one of your MCs, your co-hosts, if you like. And I just got a few house rules for everybody in the building. So uh, the emergency exits are in the back of the house uh, to your left. Uh, another thing is while the speaker is talking, please do not leave during the TED Talk. Also, please turn off or silence your phones. I don't want to, you know, it's kind of awkward if somebody's ringing and somebody's talking, you know. Uh, no photography, video, tweets, or memes. We have a photographer taking them for you. And uh, we will have a 10-minute in intermission. And I think that's all I need to say. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce your MC for the afternoon, Grace Potts. Thank you, Quincy. Hi, everybody. My name is Grace Potts. I will be your MC tonight. Um, as Quincy said, welcome to TEDx Bellarmine U 2021. We're so glad to have our small audience here and our viewers at home. So thank you so much for joining us. And I think a lot of us would agree that within the past year, we've all had a lot of moments where we just said, what on earth? Oh, yeah. It's been a crazy year politically, socially. I mean, we're all worried about different things. Um, and the, the thought of what on earth really can bring up fear, can bring up excitement. It brings up a lot of different things. And I think our speakers will really communicate that with you tonight. So thank you again so much for joining us. We're so excited to have you here. Awesome. Grace, I think you're on top of the world, by the way. I, what on earth? It looks like I'm on earth. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, um, our first speaker tonight is uh, the founder of the Latin Music Awards for Kentucky. He's a community leader, a digital marketing professional, professional, a media contributor, and musician. He has a lot of hats. He has served on the board of directors and led nonprofits. He holds a bachelor's in communications and music, a master's in music, and a master's in business administration. We were actually talking backstage and he was like, I just can't pass up all these opportunities and that is clear. Currently he is finishing a master's in digital media right here at Bellarmine. Everyone please welcome Israel Cuenca. Lubol has been called top music it's seen in America according with Times Magazine. Lubol has been named top most cultural city in America, according with, uh, with uh, Travel and Leisure magazine, and as well, top world festival and events uh, music it's seen, uh, according with the International Association of Events and, and, and Travel. 2019 was a year of great music. Thousands of people were gathering together to celebrate music. Musicians were touring all over Kentucky and all over the world. The recording studios were having hundreds of people recording every week. 
we saw music driving, and we, we said in Louisville, let's keep it weird. Music was amazing, connecting people, cultures from all over the world. In that spirit, I created the Latin Music Awards. I founded the Latin Music Awards. It seemed like a cool idea at that time, but it became something bigger than I thought. We supported hundreds of artists here in Kentucky. We connected with, this, uh, with a community here to bring in diversity and inclusion. We had more than 50 artists nominated that night. We gave it scholarships, and we create an opportunity for more musicians to support each other. I remember in 2020, at the beginning of 2020, we were uh, putting together the second edition. We didn't know that COVID was coming. I remember my boss came to me and said, Israel, take a few weeks. I think we're going to start working from home, and then we'll come back. We don't know how long it's going to take this. We didn't know much about COVID. What it was one week, it turned into three, four weeks, one month. It's been a year until now. Everything changing for us. So we start thinking what we can do, what I can do to support the community, the artists, the music industry in Kentucky. Today, musicians are just playing online. They use their phone, the computer, on social media to put their music. Audiences are gone. Today is just online, it's virtual. No audiences, and music is all about audiences and connection with each other. We saw on social media, everything is canceled. We go to restaurants, it's closed. We go to venues, everything is postponed. Tours are being canceled. Musicians are, are, are not having the gigs. Artists are home again after many, many years of touring. The, the economical impact to musicians is unprecedented. We have never seen this before. And it will, uh, the music industry has been one of the first ones to be affected and probably will be one of the last ones to recover. According to different studies, millions and millions of dollars just in the city of Louisville are lost in the music industry. Billions of dollars nationally and internationally. Musicians who have been touring every single day or playing every single day have to stay home. They don't have jobs. Everything is gone. They have to be drivers. They have to be delivering food. They have to be doing social work. They have to change to something else because pro the industry is gone. Musicians in Tower have, musicians in general have an unbreakable heart, an innovative brain and heart. And that's what we see today. We see hundreds of musicians putting everything online. But we don't realize that most of them don't even know how to use some technology. They don't know how to use the social media platforms to put the music online and how to transmit and connect with artists. But the heart of musicians are amazing. They have a great heart, and they put a lot of work and effort to put some music for you. In that effort, I say, what can I do to help the community? And I put, in 2019, I put the Latin Music Awards. We had hundreds of people. We reached over one million people online. And then in 2020, what can I do to help the community? How can I support? And I say, I'm going to do the virtual Latin Music Awards series. And that was the first time, actually, the Latin Music Awards is the first Latin Music Awards in this region. There's not been done in, in, in Illinois. There's not been done in, in South Carolina, in Ohio, in Kentucky, ever. So it was the first time. I thought it was just going to be an event, a simple event, but it became something bigger than I thought. So in 2020, I said, what can I do to help my community? How can I help the economy in, in one way or another? So I put a virtual series event. I invite different musicians from town. We recorded in La La Land studio, and we put a series of concerts for the community. Hundreds of thousands of people were able to watch, connect with these musicians. This activates the economy, because behind these events, there is photographers, there is sound engineers, there is videographers. There is so many people involved, and I was so honored to put this together. But at the same time, it's like, okay, we have the second edition of the Latin Music Awards that only know is just showing music, but it's connecting different cultures, ethnicities, bringing and boost the economy. So I say, we're going to do it. And I, we did it again, and we did it the Latin Music Awards, second edition virtually. It was something new, something different and unique for me and for my team and for everyone. 
because we were living in a very difficult times in 2020. We have 11 categories where we celebrate and honor the great work of different musicians. We did it virtually, we did it at University of Louisville. It was all virtual. The winners were from different parts of the world who live here in Kentucky, who contribute to the culture, to the economy here in Kentucky. And this event was an event to connect, as I said before, the community, to bring our diverse community together and helping our economy and these musicians who've been working so hard for many, many years. And with this, we were able to give some marketing opportunities, PR opportunities, and just connecting with different people. I'm Hispanic, and for me it was, I want to contribute to the community. This amazing state of Kentucky, how can I help? How can I connect? And I've been playing with different musicians, from, from the jazz genre, uh, classical music, to pop music. And for me it was putting this together to connect different artists. We not only had different nominees and awards and just celebrating diversity, but it was more of that. So we gave four scholarships to four students, Latino students, who can study music and can continue pursuing uh, uh, music studies. So that was something that we were very, very honored. And we were very surprised how me, many companies, m big, big companies to small companies supporting us. The community come together to celebrate this. Actually, it was one of the few awards, music awards that were made in the whole state of Kentucky in 2020. And we're very proud to put this together. But most importantly, to support our community and connect and bring this awareness of our music industry is suffering very, very much. Probably it will be the last one to recover. How can we do to help and support our music industry? Number one, subscribe to their channel. Subscribe to their email list. Go buy their music. Watch their videos. There is a lot today, a lot of organizations and foundations that are supporting musicians. Go donate. Every dollar count, and they are in need of your support. During this time, if there is anything good that we can see that happen towards the music industry is creativity. This has been a moment for musicians to rediscover themselves, to bring their creativity alive again. They have more time to create, more time to be with family. And who knows, maybe we will see the, the next best hits, music hits in the next years because of this pandemic. We will see a lot of musicians composing and creating amazing things. We are looking forward to see that. When are we going to come back again to reunite and celebrate hundreds, thousands of people in festivals and enjoying music? We don't know yet. But when that moment comes, I encourage you to support musicians, local musicians. Go support them and help them to survive after this tremendous crisis. In 2020, some of the most well-known musicians got together to put a song called Live Up Louisville. Teddy Abrams, the Louisville conductor of the Louisville Orchestra, was in charge of this. He was as well part of the Latin Music Awards as one of the judges in 2019. And there was different musicians who I had been playing with before, I had collaborated and I worked with them before, like Jacory Arthur, Carly Johnson, great musicians here in town that put this together. And I want to leave you with this thought and this part of the song. To remember the music industry brings us hope. Bring us together. Bring ethnicities and diversity together. And I can tell you, and I can leave you with this, with this talk. With a little bit of music in the power of us, we can leave each other off. Thank you. Great. Everybody give one more round of applause for Israel. All righty, everybody. We're going to keep it moving. Uh, our next speaker is majoring in clinical psychology and political science and is minoring in criminal justice studies right here at Bellarmine. In her free time, she enjoys reading, cooking, and engaging in bipartisan discussion with industry executives through the National Millennial Community. Everyone, please give a big round of applause for our next speaker, Ann Pearson. 
On March 2020, on March 13th, 2020, Brianna Taylor was shot and killed inside her apartment by police officers who had come to serve a warrant to search for drugs, none of which were later found on the property. Following her deaths, protests quickly spread across her hometown and later across the country and the world following the death of George Floyd. Protest leaders not only took to the streets, but also to social media to express their grief, their anger, and their frustration. And as a member of a generation which relies heavily on social media as a source of news, I was immersed in their words. At the same time, I was also taking a class on the spiritual author Thomas Merton, who was a Trappist monk at the Abbey of Gethsemane near Bardstown, Kentucky. While he's best known for his autobiography, The Seven Story Mountain, and his writings on contemplation and interfaith dialogue, he also wrote extensively on social issues and specifically on race in response to the first civil rights movement of the 1960s. It was these later writings on race which caught my attention the most because he so accurately described some of the current social issues which we are facing that there were several times I actually had to put the book down just to process what he'd said. In many ways, he was so accurately describing our situation that it felt like the Black Lives Matter protesters were echoing his words. In his most famous piece on race, Letters to a White Liberal, Merton directly addresses this titled group, who he believed were more harmful to the movement than conservatives who openly opposed it. In it, he describes white liberals as those who support the movement because they feel they have to to maintain their image of themselves as a liberal, but who value their material comforts, their security, and their congenial relations with the establishment over this volatile idealism. In essence, those who say they support the movement, but who will drop out the moment it affects them in any way. Perhaps the best example of this white liberalism in the past year was the trend of the black squares on social media in June 2020. For a few days, it became the popular thing to do to post a black square on your social media as a show of support for the Black Lives Matter movement. And everyone was doing it, from kids to adults to major corporations. So it very quickly devolved from a show of support to what was essentially an I'm not racist sticker that people were putting on their feed to make sure that all the people who followed them knew that they didn't actively oppose the movement. It was a very performative action. It didn't force anyone to face their white passivity or privilege and certainly didn't make people fight against racism. Unfortunately, in addition to being performative, the squares actively harmed the BLM movement because they were being posted using the same hashtags the protesters were using to communicate information, quite literally blacking out the voices of the movement. Another example of the white liberalism which Merton would have disapproved of came in the form of the leaders in Louisville and their response to the protests following Breonna Taylor's death. People like the mayor issued official statements of support for the movement, but quickly turned around to clarify on social media that this support was conditional on the protesters remaining in certain areas of the city and staying out of the way. In essence, these leaders were asking the protesters to make themselves ignorable. It is exactly this kind of behavior from white liberals which Merton condemned because he believed that it was leading to the development of a revolution in our country. For as he describes it, revolutions are always the result of situations in which the drive of an underprivileged mass of humanity can no longer be contained by token concessions. Taking this to heart means that liberals can no longer walk the fine line between appeasing protesters with small changes 
while simultaneously trying to avoid upset among conservative communities who have opposed those changes since the 1960s and beyond. Justice is long overdue, and African-American communities are getting tired. Tired of reforms like the ones following Breonna Taylor's death, which increased surveillance in their neighborhoods by moving police officers in, and tired of receiving government payouts for their murdered brothers, sons, sisters, and daughters. When I've had the chance to talk to local protest leaders over the past few months, they have made it very clear that it is by the grace and the patience of African-American communities alone that we have not already had a revolution in a country which was founded on slavery and continues to imprison disproportionate numbers of African-American men and women into a for-profit prison system which benefits off of their free labor. Compounding all of these injustices, and so many more that I don't have time to mention, is what Merton calls the incredible inhumanity of our unwillingness to listen, even for a moment, to what the movement has to say. In Breonna Taylor's Louisville, protests occurred for hundreds of concurrent nights following her death. And not much changed, except a few token concessions. So in this increasingly intense situation, which Merton so accurately described, what is the role of the white liberal if we actually want to play a part in the movement and make a difference? Merton offers us some solutions to this question. First, he makes it clear that we have to listen. Because if we do not understand why people are protesting, and we do not know what they are marching for, they will never believe that we are actually genuine in our attempts to help. And there's no excuse not to know. We have access to a larger glut of resources than ever known to man at any point in history. Every book and every film ever made on the subject of racism and new stories of the injustices in our streets crossing our screens every day. But educating ourselves is not enough. As local protest leader and wonderful poet Hannah Drake says, white people just need to face themselves. We aren't going to study or Netflix our way out of racism. We need to admit and face our way out of racism. And for white liberals, there will be a lot of admitting that we need to do. We have to acknowledge that our privilege comes from the fact that we are in a society that is designed for people who look like me, from what is considered professional dress and behavior, to what dialects of the English language are correct, to who gets an entire year for their history, and whose is relegated to a month and who gets shot in a nighttime police raid, and who gets to walk away with their life. Once we have listened and admitted our privilege, the next step, Merton says, is to join together and look for a way to reform the social systems creating inequality. As he wrote, join together in a creative political experiment not be alarmed at some of the sacrifices that would necessarily be involved. Ending inequality is going to require changing the heart and soul of our nation. It will not be fun, it will not be comfortable, and it most certainly won't be easy. But as Hannah Drake reminds us, who said that this was going to feel good? We have a chance now to actually acknowledge our white passivity and privilege, to make the decision to join the movement no matter the sacrifices, and to heed Merton's warnings to white liberals that if we do not change our performative ways, there will be a revolution. It's time to take the challenge. Thank you.
That was really impactful. Everybody give one more round of applause for Anne. That was great. All right, we're gonna move on to our next speaker. Uh, he's in his final year at Bellarmine. We're keeping it close to home for this first half. He's studying music with an emphasis in jazz studies and political science. He's a member of the Bellarmine Honors Program and a participant in several student jazz ensembles. Please, get up it, please give it up for Joshua McCorkle. There's a really fun debate that musicians like myself like to get into about what exactly music is. So if you take the technical definition of music, all it is is sound organized in groups of rhythm and with changes in the note or the frequency of the pitch. So by that definition, me talking to you today is music. So then you get into the argument of, well, does talking constitute music? Does there have to be a form or words or more rhythm? And where do we draw the line? And I think what that really gets to the heart of is the fact that music at its essence is one of the essential things that we experience in life. I don't think I know anybody personally who gets in their car and drives to work in the morning and doesn't put on music. And if you know somebody who does, I would check on them because they might not be okay. But there's something about music that really speaks to the heart of all of us. And so what I'm going to ask you guys to do is close your eyes for just a second with me and think about a song that makes you deeply happy, something that touches your soul. So there's not a lot of things that do that for people. And so when I was thinking about the research that I needed to do or wanted to do for my senior thesis, I was thinking about music that really touched my soul and that really resonated with me in a way. And so the research that I've been doing for the past couple of, well, I guess almost two years now, is how a white person like me can listen to the music of black men and understand their experiences through that. Because there's only so much that reading or looking at pictures can really convey. And that's not to take away from the fact that that is important. We should be reading the works of marginalized people. But there's something about music that really spoke to my soul. So I've been doing this comparative analysis of the music of Kanye West, who whether you love him or hate him, you have to admit is an incredible artist, and Charles Mingus, who I'm sure many people are less familiar with, but in a very similar way, was painted by the media as this angry black man, the same way Kanye West is painted as this angry black man, and how the music that they're creating, these soundscapes that they're painting, can really, really speak to us, and how people like me, who haven't had to worry about the lives of my brother when he goes to the gas station, can listen to that and analyze it and think about the fact that that means something deeper than just music. The music that they created is not music that everybody likes. It's not music that everybody knows, and it's not music that is easy to listen to. And it's not meant to be. What it's meant to be is it's meant to be an expression of their life and every experience that they've had up until the point in time that you hear that. And there's always the argument of whether or not the meaning of a piece of art is what the artist intended it as, or what the listener or viewer intends it as. And I think what we need to think about is how those two things can and should reach a similar point. Like I said earlier, music is one of the essential things that we experience as humans. Music touches us all, whether you listen to hip hop or R&B or country music or anything like that, you have an experience with music, I'd be willing to bet. Everybody in this room and everybody watching at home does. And what that can really remind us, and what I think a lot of the other speakers have talked about and what a lot of people have talked about in the last year, is that as divided as we may feel, as separated as we may feel as humans, and as many differences as we may have, there is a fundamental sameness in humanity. 
you know, the fact that I've had different experiences from my black friends or from my female friends or from any number of people isn't something that needs to be taken away. I'm not trying to say that we're all the same and that we all experience the same things because that would be a lie. What I'm trying to say is there's something fundamental about us as humans, about the fact that we can all sit in this room together and hear these ideas and think about these things. There's some deep part of us that is human. And for me, personally, the thing that gets at that the most, the easiest, is music. So what I'd like to do is share with you guys that maybe, just maybe, if we listen to music, really, really listen, not just to the words or to the melody or the harmony or the rhythm, if you look at music as a whole, we can understand each other better. And that's really, really where we can start to see change, is when we understand one another. When you can look at another person and understand that they are a human being, whether you agree with them or disagree with them or look like them or talk like them, there's a deep sameness. So what I'd like to leave you guys with today is the idea that when you go home and you put on the song in your car, don't listen to it while you drive and sing along without thinking about the fact that maybe the person who made that song is a person. Maybe the person who is rapping to you grew up in poverty. And maybe the rap doesn't reflect what everybody in the media or like to portray it as when I was in middle school and high school. Like, all they talk about is objectifying women and making money. Maybe it's this amalgamation of their experiences up until the point that they stepped in front of a microphone. The same way the words I'm saying right now are just the combination of everything that's happened to me until I was standing in front of you. So just take some time anytime you put on a song. And of course you should enjoy it because you shouldn't be listening to it if you don't. But really, really think about the fact that somebody made that song. Somebody is passing that along to you. And whether you like the song or agree with what they're saying, they're still human and so are you. Thank you guys. Thank you, Joshua, that was great. Everybody give it up for him one more time. Alrighty, now I know I said last time we were keeping it close to home, but we're gonna move a little farther out now. Our next speaker is based in Louisville, but he is Australian. He's a dad, a physical therapist, an educator, and a community advocate. And I did get to meet his daughter yesterday in her really awesome light up shoes. I see you, girl. He is also honored to be the founder and executive director of the Earhart Club. Give it up for Angus Williams. My daughter Sophia and I have a tradition of hitting the trails. We learn about each other for hiking adventures. We learn about each other and the world, and we chat about the things that matter. Recently, what mattered was some tears about being ignored at kindergarten. <laughs> I, um, it, it was bedtime, so she said, Dad, I felt invisible. It was bedtime, so before I could offer a, a clumsy fix, she crawled into my lap and fell asleep. Perhaps a little sad, I felt a little bit helpless, but it was okay without a solution. We all feel invisible at times, like our voice doesn't matter. I could have said, Sophia, find your voice or speak up, your voice matters. But when you feel like you don't have a voice, finding your voice is like telling a blind person to see. Having a voice and giving voice to the community, to, to the people, is one of the great promises of any community. It's how we change the world. Um, <laughs> oh, uh, it's, it's how we change the world. So I've totally lost my spot. <laughs> um, the so it's, it's how we change the world. Community is, uh, is one of the non-negotiable traits of, of humanity. We, we, every civilization through time was built on two, two, two pillars, community, humility and community. Strong communities 
recognize, embrace every individual and put value on understanding the strengths of every individual who is inspired to find and understand their unique strengths to best serve the community. The community is stronger than the sum of all individuals. It is strongest when every individual is strongest. It's a healthy relationship, symbiotic, and that each party is, is stronger when the other party is at their best. The, the expectation for all is an individual relationship with community that is reciprocal. We provide value and we are valued. The opposite of value is importance. To become important, we import value from the community. We devalue others. We are all born, we are each enter the world with 100 points of value. And we leave with 100 points of value. At every moment in between, we have exactly 100 points of value. Our brain might trick us at times into feeling worth less, at times that we're the best, like we're the best things since sliced bread. Sliced bread exists. Importance is an illusion, a trick that exploits our basic and healthy human need for individual significance. The, the original sin of community was the disguise of importance as value. Humility and community are both the great strength and the great vulnerability of humankind. We are wired to appreciate the strengths of others before our own. If we exp explore all language, it is always either inspiring us toward humility and community or exploiting our longing for humility and community. Communities have problems. It's normal. We provide value to our community by, by using our, unique our individual strengths to help solve these problems. Important people love problems, especially identifying them. The easiest way to identify problems is to label normal variances as problems. Someone identifies a problem and values us enough to include us in the solution. That level playing field shifts, and we're okay with it because it's for the good of the community. Some people here want this. Up here says, I can teach you this so you too can serve the community. I can use the help of people like you because there's so many problems. You'll be helping me and the community. I'll call you level two so everybody understands. Now run along and serve your community with what I told you. That number two is gold, immediate credibility. They're closer to the source, obviously, and have the inside track on healing this broken community. Before you know it, there's level fours, 24s, and more. At each level, every individual genuinely believes they are providing value to the community. In truth, each level of importance requires they lose part of their individual voice to the group and, and shift their focus to the weaknesses of lower levels. We have traded value for importance, community for power. On this dysfunctional treadmill, where the solutions are always in the hands of the people more important than ourselves, we have learned not to trust ourselves. We've been disempowered and divided alongside language of empowerment, unity, and best interests. We learn that our feelings are more potent than our values. We have totally weaponized the human condition. <laughs> and, and that mind trick at level one has led us right here, systemic devaluation. Everyone, every level on that treadmill identifies as a victim. They have all been devalued, lost their individual voice to the group. Every problem we pour resources into with little impact is less symptom, symptom and more a problem of us shifting too far from our humanity. The treadmill is about power and, and control. It, it eliminates discourse and wrecks community because we all know and none of us understand. So how does Sophia find and own her voice, understand her values, and learn her value? Well, that's not a solo journey. So children come into our lives at a time when we're on this treadmill, restless, irritable, and discontent. They're the value we're looking for. 
<laughs> they're the value we're looking for. The beginning of everything that ever matters and the end of everything that doesn't. They're our opportunity to revisit our values and learn our value. I'm part of an organization, the Earhart Club. Our mission is to connect girls with their own unique voice before they lose it to the expectations of others. We've served over 1,200 girls, plus their, their mums and grown-ups. Our mission was always to connect, to, to nurture meaningful relationships between a girl and her mum to benefit the girl. Our outcomes reflect a deeper impact. At our Take to Flight graduations, most mums cry as they describe rediscovering their values and relearning their value alongside their daughter. The ripple effect is felt through families, classrooms, and communities as the warm embrace of genuine acceptance. Day one of each cohort, we ask these second and third grade girls, who understands you the most? 73% say no one understands them. 9% say mum. We ask mums, do you think you really understand your daughter? 78% say yes. So 9% of girls say mum gets them, and nearly 80% of mums say they get their daughter. That treadmill teaches us to know people at the expense of understanding them. At the end of 10 weeks, 77% of girls say mum understands them the most. And down, up from 9%, and 36% of mums say they understand their daughter, down from 78%. The girls have gained community alongside their mum, and mums have rediscovered their humility. The path, individual engagement, asking questions and honouring the answer, learning together about women of influence and each other. By seeing the world through her daughter's eyes, and instead, instead of insisting she, her daughter see the world through, her, through hers, a girl learns to trust herself. She and mum come to see the best in each other and the best in themselves. And that's how the world gets changed. We aim to give individual girls a voice and gave rise to a community of girls and women who lift each other up because that's what people do when they, under, when they learn, when they trust and value themselves through being trusted and valued. Community is the common understanding that we all have exactly 100 points of, points of value and we are all equally the solution. Thank you. Great job. Everybody give it up for Angus Williams one more time. All righty, next up, we've got something a little different for you. You all may know the name Amanda Gorman. That's because Amanda Gorman was the first inaugural poet. She read a poem at uh, President Biden's inauguration just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, she is also soon to be featured on the cover of Time magazine. And you may also know her from an event that we had on 10 10 20 by Ted, and uh, so please get excited for a video from the now very famous and um, very world-renowned Amanda Gorman. On Christmas Eve, 1968, Astronaut Bill Anders snapped a photo of the Earth as Apollo 8 orbited the moon. Those three guys were surprised to see from their eyes a planet looked like an Earth rise, a blue orb hovering over the moon's gray horizon with deep oceans and silver skies. It was our world's first glance at itself, our first chance to see a shared reality, a declared stance, and a commonality, a glimpse into our planet's mirror. And as threats drew nearer, our own urgency became clearer as we realized that we hold nothing dearer than this floating body we all call home. We've known that we're caught in the throes of climactic changes some say will just go away while some simply pray to survive another day. For it is the obscure, the oppressed, the poor who when the disaster is declared done still suffer more than anyone. 
Climate change is the single greatest challenge of our time. Of this, you're certainly aware. It's saddening, but I cannot spare you from knowing an inconvenient fact because it's getting the facts straight that gets us to act and not to wait. So I tell you this not to scare you, but to prepare you, to dare you to dream a different reality where despite disparities, we all care to protect this world, this riddled blue marvel, this little true marvel to master the verve and the nerve to see how we can serve our planet. You don't need to be a politician to make it your mission to conserve, to protect, to preserve that one and only home that is ours to use your unique power to give next generations the planet they deserve. We are demonstrating, creating, advocating. We heed this inconvenient truth because we need to be anything but lenient with the future of our youth. And while this is a training and sustaining the future of our planet, there is no rehearsal. The time is now, 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 because the reversal of harm and protection of a future so universal should be anything but controversial. So, Earth, pale blue dots, we will fail you not just as we chose to go to the moon. We know it's never too soon to choose hope. We choose to do more than cope with climate change. We choose to end it. We refuse to lose. We do this and more, not because it's very easy or nice, but because it is necessary. Because with every dawn, we carry the weights of the fates of this celestial body orbiting a star. And as heavy as the weight sounded, it doesn't hold us down, but it keeps us grounded, steady, ready, because an environmental movement of this size is simply another form of an earth rise. To see it, close your eyes, visualize that all of us in this room and outside of these walls or in these halls, all of us change makers are in a spacecraft floating like a silver raft in space and we see the face of a planet anew. We relish the view, we witness its round green and brilliant blue, which inspires us to ask deeply, wholly, what can we do? Open your eyes, know the future of this wise planet is right in sight, right in all of us. Trust this earth uprising, all of us bring light to exciting solutions never tried before, for it is our hope that implores us at our uncompromising core to keep rising up for an earth more than worth fighting for. She may not be here in person, but we can give a hand to Amanda Gorman. I feel like she deserves it. All right, everybody get excited because it is intermission time. The intermission will last about 10 minutes. Um, and once you come back from that intermission, once the doors close, we will not open them again until the event is finished. When you walk out these doors, you will find refreshments. So please treat yourself to whatever you would like. Use the restroom and we will see you back here in about 10.
Welcome back, everyone. Hope you enjoyed the refreshments and the coffee provided by Center Goss. Big thanks to them for that. Um, so our next speaker, she may not be here, um, but we do have a great video from her. She is a renowned international speaker, award-winning author, and thought leader in the areas of leadership, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Give it up virtually for Mariella Daba. What on earth is happening with gender equity in the workplace as a result of the pandemic? In 2019, the first case of coronavirus was identified in Wuhan, China. Less than a year later, we have several vaccines that are around 95% effective. An astonishing achievement by any measure, right? that within a year of a new virus that has unleashed a global pandemic and that required such a complex set of steps from research to developing, testing, and producing a vaccine, we already are in the middle of the process of vaccinating millions of people around the world. In contrast, gender inequity in the workplace, a decades-old issue, remains unresolved as if we couldn't apply research-driven solutions to a social problem as we do to a public health issue. But make no mistake, gender inequity is not a women's issue. Just like the COVID virus didn't just affect a community in a faraway land, gender inequity infects our culture and everyone in our society. It's a global pandemic, and it also needs an urgent vaccine. We were barely making any progress before COVID, and now the latest studies show that that little progress may be wiped out as a result of the extraordinary demands being placed on women. Let me give you a list of symptoms linked to the spreading of the pandemic of gender inequity. Being in charge of everyone all the time. Whether they are leaders or individual contributors, and even if some of them had helped before, or if their kids were in school during work hours, women now have to juggle the blended environment of remote work from home. Having no time to reset or to be alone. As a result of working remotely, the little reset time we used to have during our commute has evaporated. And because of new responsibilities, most women have no time for themselves, something that has become quite alienating. Making less, so quitting more. As women's salaries are historically lower than their male partners, if there's a household choice to be made regarding who will give up their job and take care of the home and the family, it's usually the woman who steps back. Withstanding disproportionate impact, non-white women and women with different abilities are being impacted much more than white women and are quite often micromanaged by bosses who are still not ready to practice remote leadership. And although the new normal is affecting absolutely everybody, we still see a larger percentage of female talent affected. One in three mothers are ready to scale back or step out of the workplace altogether. 39% of senior women state that they are burnt out compared to 29% of senior men. And 54% of senior women confess to being exhausted compared to 41% of senior men. But despite the fact that gender inequity in the workplace is quite dire, there are some great opportunities we should take advantage of in order to speed up a treatment. The end of the corner office. This coveted perk to which few women had access before the pandemic has been democratized, as most key decisions are now being made in the kitchen, an environment where most women play as locals. We have already seen how effective both women and men can be from the new corner office at challenging digital and physical space. And that's why I decided to have this talk from my corner office. Updated requirements to be an executive. The generalized stay-at-home situation has affected everyone from senior executives to entry-level associates, allowing for a shift in the old belief that to be an executive, a person had to be physically in the office and be able to travel a lot, something that often excluded women. Leaders have become human. Having their own kids 
throw a tantrum on camera during conference calls has humanized leaders who used to be perceived as not having to deal with everyday life issues as everyone else. They have tacitly given permission to women to openly perform their many roles, including being mothers and caretakers. By removing the stigma, leaders have enabled everyone to share their own reality. Leaders are personally invested in supporting their teams. As they become more aware of the circumstances of their various team members, leaders are customizing their support to make sure they don't lose female and diverse talent. So they're making themselves much more available to address individual challenges and growth potential than they were ever before. Leveling the playing field for all remote workers. When in the past there was an unwritten hierarchy that devalued people calling in in favor of those who worked at headquarters, now everyone's in the same boat. And because in the past women took advantage of the remote work benefit more often than men, they used to be the ones who suffer most of the consequences. So what can we do to propel a global response when nobody knows what the future holds? At the Red Shoe Movement, one of the research and development solutions we've been investing a lot of time and energy in is fostering design for gender inclusion inside organizations, based on the research of Dr. Iris Bonnet of Harvard University. And we have also been implementing some very successful concrete solutions. Let me share three of them. Taking a visible stand for gender inclusion. A few years ago, we launched Red Shoe Tuesday, an ongoing thriving initiative that proposes a day of the week for people to wear red shoes and accessories to normalize the conversation on gender inclusion and invite people in a fun, non-confrontational way to come up with concrete ways to increase female leadership at the highest levels of organizations. The goal is to aim for a global leap of consciousness so that overnight our firms reflect the makeup of society. We push towards our goal with concrete, ownable actions like that of wearing a visual reminder every week. Listening intently to act fittingly. With our allyship circles, we apply a very specific method for having courageous conversations among a diverse group of people from different backgrounds and hierarchies in the company so that in the very act of having the conversation, we're leveling the playing field and everyone feels heard and a vital part of solving the problem. It's a way of giving leaders a chance at empathetic listening so as a result, they can offer tailored solutions to their team members. Remembering that inclusion is not on pause. Back in March 2020, when the pandemic hit, we proactively rolled out inclusion is not on pause to put even more focus on the fact that if we took our eyes off the ball, gender inclusion would suffer greatly. So we created another set of tactics individuals and organizations could implement, like digital backdrops to help people make a statement during their virtual calls. They serve as an invitation for anyone who needs to discuss a particular situation to approach those displaying the backdrop. And we also created snackable content for everyone to remain vigilant. Now, I've shared here what the Red Shoe Movement is doing so we can co-create solutions. Because unlike with COVID, where we got a vaccine in less than a year of the first case, Despite all the research that has been done for decades around what works to reach gender equity in the workplace, the vaccine for gender inequity has not yet been invented. So we must take a similar collaborative approach, join our labs and use our data-driven solutions to expedite this vaccine to market. I have to leave you now because I have a group meeting with the gender equity scientists who are developing the most promising vaccines. I will keep you posted on our progress. Thank you. That was great. 
All righty, we're going to keep it moving. Bellarmine students, this name probably looks familiar to you. You've probably received an email or two from this next speaker. He's an information technology evangelist, experienced in leading and aligning IT efforts with institutional direction. He has a varied work background ranging from entrepreneurial startup environments to highly structured corporate operations. Throughout his career, he has been successful in developing, communicating, and implementing information technology strategies. Please give it up for Eric Satterley. You know, I've, I've always been fascinated by computers um, throughout my life. I grew up really interested in computing, and it, it drove me to engineering school, where I wanted to learn how computers work, how do you build computers, how do, how do they process. And one of the classes that I had in school was called Computer Vision. It was a really good class. We worked with computers, interfacing them to the real world through cameras, bringing in images, and, and learning to process those images. And one of the assignments that we had was to do recognition of numbers, handwritten numbers, uh, the numbers zero through nine. So we had index cards and we wrote numbers on individual index cards and then used cameras to process that and, and recognize those images through algorithms that we were to develop. And I wrote my number eight and I, I remember my number eight. It was a beautiful eight, I think you would all agree. And I, I took a lot of care and effort into to crafting my circles and, and then working on algorithms that would look at the area of those circles and how the circles aligned and to really tell that that was the number eight. And I felt pretty good about that. And then the day of uh, the presentation of my assignment came, my professor came in and I dutifully handed over my index cards ready to, to be graded. And I remember my professor taking index cards and tossing them and then pulling out a different set. And you know that feeling that sometimes you have when you, you know you're screwed? Well, I had it because this was the number eight that got put under the camera. And I immediately saw the fallacy in my algorithm in my mind. And once my process ran and told my professor that that was the number six, I, I realized I wasn't going to get a good grade on that. But I did learn a really good lesson. And I brought a lot of bias to what I thought the number eight looked like. And I developed a system to process that number eight based on the bias that I had. I didn't think about the variance in the different number eights that might exist as people write them in different ways. And that may seem like a, a trivial example. It's, it's just a number in the number eight, and it's probably not too terribly offended. But this exists in other systems. Let me tell you about a system um, called Google Cloud Vision. It sounds very impressive. In fact, Google Cloud Vision, if you read the slug line on their website, they detect objects and faces, read printed and handwritten text, and build valuable metadata. Valuable metadata. So just last year, some people did an experiment with Google Cloud Vision, and you submit a photo, and Google will tell you what's in the photo. And this was the experiment that was done. So essentially the same picture, it's a hand, holding, as it turns out, a monocular or a digital thermometer. One hand is dark skin. In that same image, the hand was shaded light. Both submitted to Google. It did a great job of coming back and saying that there was a hand in each photo with a high degree of confidence. But you can see that the dark skin hand, Google thought was holding a gun. And the light skin hand, it successfully identified as holding a digital thermometer, a monocular. When Google became aware of that problem, they quickly fixed it, as you would hope they would do. And this is how they fixed it. They redacted the word gun from the return on the dark skin hand. And you see, it's not easy to fix a problem like that, because the problem isn't a switch that you flip, that you turn off. The problem is in the engineering. It's systemic. It's baked into the algorithm. Now, I don't at all think that the engineers at Google were evil people. I don't think that they did this by malice. I think that this happens because they built their system and they probably did iterative testing based on the data that they had on hand, pun intended, because their hand probably looked a lot like my hand. And that might be what my algorithms would come back with in processing data. But this problem exists in other things too. 
This year has been an amazing year in a massive shift to online education. This has happened across the world. The pandemic has really driven us to accelerate what we do online. And to do that on scale, we absolutely need technology to be our friend, to help us, to assist in that uplift. So when you think about trying to simply proctor exams on scale, it's, it's nearly impossible without some type of assistance. Artificial intelligence to the rescue. So now teachers, professors can proctor exams online using automation and artificial intelligence to help do that. The problem is, as this happened throughout the year, we started to find that people with darker skin were disadvantaged by these systems. Different studies and reports, but in some cases, facial recognition doesn't work as well with people with darker skin. They couldn't even gain access to the system to take their exam. Or, in other cases, they were flagged for potential cheating at much higher rates than people with lighter skin. How, how does that happen? And so, if we think about there's bias that I've talked to you about in handwriting recognition, in racial um, and, and skin tone, but what about other things? What about ethics and morality? Does bias creep in there through artificial intelligence? We, we currently have systems today that are making decisions, artificial intelligence decisions, that decide things like who gets a loan, who gets hired, who gets paroled. Artificial intelligence makes those decisions. Is bias in that decision-making process? And what about taking it even beyond that and we start to think about life and death decisions? Does artificial intelligence make life and death decisions? We'll take, for instance, self-driving cars. They do a pretty good job, and they certainly have crash and accident avoidance systems in there. But at some point, there might be a, a, an accident that comes up that's hard to just avoid, and it has to be the lesser of two evils. And that decision is made in an instant. The car is driving along at a high rate of speed. A child steps in front. The car can hit the child or swerve into the oncoming lane. It's got two choices. Who decides what choice? Is it the consumer's decision? They bought the car. Is it the insurance company's decision? Is it politicians that decide this? Who decides? Do we know? We should know. What about a military drone? It's now an autonomous attack drone, and its prime directive is to attack people that maybe have a gun. I hope they didn't use the Google Vision API to make that determination. But this isn't a new problem. We've dealt with the, the struggle between humanity and technology for a long time. Um, deep thinkers from years ago really, really considered this. Uh, I want to show you a quote from a pioneer in healthcare information systems written 35 years ago. If you go back with me, 35 years. And the point was made that it's, it's in the crucible of the individual that technology most forcefully confronts human values. It's what artificial intelligence is doing. It's confronting human values. It's making decisions on human values that we are imparting into the algorithms that do this. And it's really important because AI is doing more and more. It's making more important decisions. It's making ethical decisions. It's making life and death decisions and it's making decisions that we must be intentional about addressing the bias in these systems. You know, it's been said that those that don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And I would say that if we don't learn and explore the future of artificial intelligence, then we might just be doomed to. Thank you. Awesome job. Thank you. Let's give it up for Eric one more time. You all know the drill. All right. I may be a little biased, but our next speaker is one of my professors. So I think you all are in for a treat. Besides serving as a professor, he's a filmmaker and a musician. He has an intense obsession with heavy metal music. So this should be interesting, both personally and professionally. Give it up for Dr. Mike LaRocco.
Hey folks, my name is Dr. Michael Rocco. I'm a professor of digital media, and I have an obsession with heavy metal music. I have had that since I was age 12, and I have the receipts to prove it. Here's me with my band, The Melon Heads, in the seventh grade talent show. That's me on the left. We played Metallica's For Whom the Bell Tolls. It was the only song we knew. That's me in high school, um, rehearsing with my band, Threshold of Pain. We didn't play much outside of the basement. Much more legitimate, here was my band in college, Sala. Two of those musicians uh, went on to a pretty uh, successful career in the New York heavy metal scene. I did not go to New York to play heavy metal. I did something much more foolish. I went into academia. But uh, even then, it's still, heavy metal still finds its way into my research, which you can see this was a talk I gave at USC about the uh, extreme heavy metal vocal techniques. It was for the Department of Linguistics. And I still managed to play on the side. There's me with long hair on the right. But the point is, heavy metal has been a huge part of my life. It's not just a music that I listen to, but I'm deeply immersed within heavy metal culture. So it affects my aesthetic. It affects, as you can see, it affects my ideology. It affects my self-image. So today, we're talking about metal. And I don't know. I just love metal. What, what, what can I say? But when I heard that today's theme was what on earth, I immediately thought of metal because what on earth is a question that metalheads get asked a lot. What on earth are you listening to? What on earth is this vocalist saying? What on earth does your, does your shirt say? Or going back to Catholic school, what on earth possessed you to wear that shirt to church? The tough thing about those what on earth statements is that um, I feel like they're often not rooted in curiosity. They are rooted in skepticism and judgment. And when, they, when people say what on earth, what they really mean is what is wrong with you? And I think some of that skepticism is understandable because heavy metal is a genre that tends toward the extreme. It's extreme in its naming conventions. Cannibal corpse, suffocation, bloodbath. It's extreme in its imagery and its content. So, you know, leather and spikes, blood and guts, sex and violence. It's extreme in the music itself. So the tempos, the vocals, the musicianship, it can be loud, it can be dissonant, angry, even violent. It's sometimes hard to stomach, and I'll play you an example right here. Well. So upon hearing this, you might be wondering, why on earth does anyone listen to it? And there are many reasons that I could give as an answer, but today I'm focusing on one, and that's extremity of emotion. Because despite the extremes of heavy metal, or rather because of them, it can actually be quite therapeutic. And that's what I want to talk about today, catharsis. Oh, we're not working here. Here you go, one more, and one more. Catharsis, not the band, but the idea that heavy metal can help comfort my extreme emotions. But on to more rigorous research of this topic, and here's where I have to consult my research notes, if you'll allow me. All right. So there have been many studies about um, looking into the stereotype that people that listen to heavy metal are bad apples. And contrary to popular belief, much of the research has shown that listening to heavy metal can instead increase feelings of peace, calm, happiness, and empowerment. It can help regulate emotion, it can help listeners feel more comfortable with negative emotion, and it can build self-esteem. Lastly, it can better prepare them for dealing with mortality salience, which is the knowledge of our own impending inevitable death. So that's nice. There's a caveat, though. Um, all of these sort of benefits of listening to heavy metal only apply if you already like heavy metal. So you couldn't just like go home and listen to Bolt Thrower and then feel all calm and relaxed. Like, I will. I can. You can't. Unless you already like Bolt Thrower. In which case, please come and talk to me after the show, because like, we can chat and be friends. But still, I think that notion that angry, aggressive music can be therapeutic is not enough. 
Yes, if I go home and I listen to angry music when I'm angry, it can be cathartic. Corpse Grinder screams so that I don't have to. But the truth is, not all heavy metal is aggressive. Not all heavy metal is fast or ugly or violent or angry or depressing. And that's a stereotype that I also want to question a bit today. And I want to think about emotions beyond the angry. And I want to do that through a personal story. In March of 2020, right at the start of the pandemic, my wife gave birth to twins. Hey, there they are. And that was great, but literally the day we got back from the hospital, my wife developed a really terrible fever and a terrible cough, and she was having trouble breathing. So we took her to the ER, and she was admitted. Now, at this time, they didn't really have many COVID tests, so they wouldn't give her one. Um, so they just sort of presumed that she was positive because she had a viral infection and she had really severe pneumonia in both her lungs. Um, that first day was really scary. We didn't know much about COVID at the time, how bad it was. You know, did she have it? Did I have it? Did our babies have it? Um, she was sitting in a hospital bed and I was making some pretty grim phone calls that first day because I don't have any family in Kentucky. So if I needed to find someone to take my babies who may have COVID if I had to be hospitalized or worse. Um, it was brutal. And not like in the good heavy metal way, like, yeah, this is brutal. Like, just the awful way. It was really, really awful. Luckily, she did pull through, okay. Um, but she had to be quarantine, quarantined for 14 days. And I felt awful for her because she just went through a really difficult pregnancy and then just had a major surgery to bring these babies into the world. And now she can't hold them. She can't see them. She can't feed them for 14 days. So I felt awful. But I also felt something else. And that was the realization that I alone had to raise newborn twins with no babysitting for 14 days. My only helper was this three-year-old maniac well, I gotta say, not much help. So, oh God, oh God, there we go. Folks, that two weeks, it was extremely metal. Here's my work from home setup. Unlike my wife, who felt miserable and terrible the entire time, I felt miserable and terrible as well, uh, and heartbroken, but I also felt joy because I was bonding with these beautiful, tiny creatures. So I was going through the wildest emotional swings in my entire life. And heavy metal was my soundtrack. Now, I listen to heavy metal with my son, Oscar, all the time. He will regularly request High on Fire and Gore Guts, specifically old Gore Guts only, which is super elitist, um, but I won't get into that. People will say, oh, isn't it kind of scary for him, all the scary sounds? And I'm like, well, no, because he doesn't think Barney Greenway from Napalm Death sounds any scarier than Cookie Monster. And of those two figures, I just want to say, one of them giving terrible dietary advice, the other offering a pretty strong message against fascism. So who's really the worst influence of those two? So heavy metal has always been a big part of our household, but I can only see during the pandemic how intertwined it was with my emotions. Some days were napalm death days, just raging angry, really frustrated with our circumstance, angry music for angry times. Some days were really dark, not knowing how sick my wife was, not knowing when, you know, what it was going to be like when she came home, missing our wife and mom, FaceTime being totally inadequate. The melancholic, aching black metal of Lantelos helped me through those sad times. If I ever fell into a groove, it was through sleep. The band, not the activity. I was not experiencing that much. But that just slow, rhythmic groove of doom metal. Shrieking into the void with Ludacra. Just everybody at their wits end, all four of us. Even the dog, everybody screaming, just letting it all out through the horrifying shrieks of Lori Shanneman as our proxy, but also dancing and laughing to the joyful irreverence of Gamma Bomb, a thrash metal band that just makes me happy. Late night inspiration from Man of War, when I felt like I couldn't go on anymore, the genre of power metal just is reassuring. It's always uplifting. It made me realize that I could do it. I could make it. And we did make it. 
we emerged covered in baby poop and vomit and pizza sauce, exhausted and sleep deprived. We made it. And when we got our reunion, man, it was so sweet. So I know there are many kinds of music that people can turn to when they feel sad or when they feel intense emotions. But for me, heavy metal is different. There's something about the extremity of heavy metal that allows it to do something that other genres can't. For me, it is absolutely the best melodrama. And it's not surprising that many of the observations I made about heavy metal have been made by scholars looking at other genres of media with extreme emotions. Horror film, Hollywood melodrama from the 1940s and 50s. Soap operas. I mean, you want to talk about a genre built on sex and murder. Just ask my grandma. Like these other genres, heavy metal is powerful because it doesn't shy away from big emotions. In a world where melodramatic is usually an insult, heavy metal just leans right into it. Heavy metal will never tell you that you are too much because it is, by definition, too much. Now, I'm not going to tell you to go home and listen to metal because I know it's not for everyone. But I want you to remember that during extreme times, extreme times call for extreme soundtracks. And I hope that you have some thing, some music or some media that you can turn to to comfort your understandably extreme emotions during this pandemic. And I want you to remember that comfort doesn't always come in a hug. Sometimes it comes in a scream. Thank you. Great job, Dr. LaRocco. Thank you. One more round of applause for him. All righty, I did have the pleasure of hearing our last speaker of the night practicing last night, so I know that you guys are in for a great speech. She is an invertebrate paleontologist focusing on marine ecosystems from the Paleozoic era and loves teaching her students, friends, and family, and really anyone who will listen about all things geological. She's also passionate about working toward a sustainable future for her four tiny kids, a four-year-old and 18-month-old triplets. Please get up, give it up for Dr. Kate Belinsky. Picture this. The sky is hazy, and there are wildfires burning all over the planet. The oceans are warming up and releasing methane into the air, which is causing the Earth to get warmer and more methane is belching forth from the permafrost. Coral reefs are dying, and ex extinction is accelerating everywhere. But take a deep breath, because this is not necessarily what is happening now, but rather what actually happened 252 million years ago in an event known as the Permian Extinction, or the Great Dying. So 95% of all the species on our planet went extinct during that event, yet hardly anybody knows about it or talks about it. This happened before the dinosaurs even were on the planet. And so that's what I want to talk to you about today. There are so many lessons that you can learn about from studying the history of life on our planet and the history of Earth itself. And a lot of these lessons can be applied to some of the problems that we are experiencing today. So as a geologist and a paleontologist, I think about time differently than the average person. I think about it in terms of something known as deep time. So the average person probably thinks about time in terms of human time scales, maybe decades, 100 years, or maybe a few thousand years, the timing of the rise and fall of civilizations. But for a paleontologist, we think about time in terms of hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years, and billions of years. And these kinds of time scales are hard to conceptualize. Humans, because we think on such short time scales, we tend to be rather short-sighted about the uh, kind of impact that we have on our planet. So today, in the short amount of time I have today, I'm going to give you a crash course in Earth history so that you can have a chance to think like a geologist too. Okay, um, just to orient you, on many of the slides here, there will be a time scale at the bottom, just like you see here. On the left-hand side, it's the origin of the Earth 4.56 billion years ago, and then on the right-hand side represents today. And you'll see an arrow moving along as I progress through the slides so you can see where we are in Earth history. 
So let's start at the very beginning. The Earth formed 4.56 billion years ago in a series of collisions between asteroids colliding together and melting into a huge ball of molten rock in space. There was no atmosphere, there were no oceans, there were no layers inside the Earth, no magnetic field, and yes, there was no life whatsoever. This early Earth was not a hospitable place. So let's fast forward a mere 750 million years to where the Earth is starting to take more form. So we finally got into a temperature below the boiling point of water. So now we have oceans, we have an atmosphere, we have plate tectonics, we have layers inside the Earth that's pulsing forth a magnetic field, and our first evidence that there is life. No fossils yet, but there are biomarkers, little chemicals that tell us that life had probably gained a foothold at this point. Now, I'm going to jump forward another 200 million years, and we have our first definitive fossils. They're not that much to look at. They're kind of blobby layers of bacteria, but they are incredibly important in the history of life. They created our first oxygen, our first photo photosynthesizers, and they have been with us ever since. These creatures, for three billion years, were turning our atmosphere into oxygen, into the kind of air that supports life as we know it today. So let me jump ahead now. Three billion years, we're gonna just jump right in to where we start to see our first multicellular life in the fossil record. There's some little tiny embryos that we find and then some weird creatures like these. They kind of look like quilted feathers or like blobby wrinkled things. And we describe them in these kind of funny terms because some of these creatures, we don't really know exactly what they are. But what's interesting is that they appear in the fossil record in multiple places around the world and then they go extinct. It's as if life was experimenting and just kind of blinked out of existence. But then we can jump forward 50 more million years, and boom, we have an event called the Cambrian Explosion. It's when life kind of figuratively exploded on the scene. There are tons of fossils in the fossil record now. Some of them are familiar, things like clams and snails and sponges, and then there's all kinds of weird stuff like this, and I wish I had time to tell you about each one of them because they're super interesting. But I just wanted to show that, uh, this to you so that you can get a sense that life is weird and fascinating and wonderful and we can learn so much from it. Um, but I'll just have to move on now. So I'm going to um, move on a couple hundred million years to illustrate that the Earth is still changing. And we have all of these changes in our uh, climate and sea level rising and falling, and glaciers growing and shrinking. Some of them trigger mass extinctions, like one caused by global cooling, another caused by changes in ocean chemistry in, um, uh, all over the world. So these kinds of events, when we learn about them in Earth history, they can give us a sense of how the Earth would respond when we do things to it. And so these are the events that we can learn from and apply to how we are changing the planet today. So I'm gonna move ahead another few hundred million years to the event that I started this talk with, the Permian extinction, the great dying, where we have volcanoes, unlike any that are going off today, spewing greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, causing warming, and then causing more warming as the oceans lost their methane. And so there's 10 degrees of warming here. This is a great analog for us to study to try to understand what our current situation of climate change is like. So let's move forward now into the time of the dinosaurs. There's two mass extinctions that affected the dinosaurs, one triggered by volcanoes, and then the one that wiped them out entirely, um, the Cretaceous extinction with the asteroid impact. Moving on from there, we have the wild and wonderful world of mammals, all kinds of mammals, whales, bats, giant armadillos, giant ground sloths, and of course the egg-laying platypus. But when we think about mammals, usually what we think about as ourselves. Um, we, we often kind of put ourselves at the center of existence with everything on the earth, even though we're part of this grand sweep of time. And I always think it's a good a moment to reflect that we're not necessarily the end point of geologic time either. We just happen to be at the present day. Um, human beings only came on the scene 200,000 years ago 
a literal geological blink of an eye. But yet, you can't look out of the air, uh, window of an airplane without seeing the kinds of effects that human beings have had on this planet, whether it's all of the agriculture that we've done or the urbanization that we have had. And then we've also had a huge impact on our ocean chemistry, on our soils, on our atmosphere. So even though the Earth is so old, we, human beings, have had such a huge impact on just a few hundred years. And so we don't really think about how long it takes for a river to carve across a landscape before, boom, we put a dam on it. And we don't think about how long it takes for plankton to be deposited and buried and turned into oil before we extract it from the earth and burn it and turn it into greenhouse gases. We don't think about the native prairie grasses in Nebraska that have been putting their roots deep into the ground and creating soil before we plow it all up and create mega farms of corn. And we don't think about what would happen to the oceans if we spray excess amounts of fertilizer all over the land that washes out into the ocean and changes its chemistry. But we can learn about these things if we study the geologic past. We should think about the actions that we take in terms of geological time, in terms of deep time. Um, and if we choose to ignore the lessons of deep time, we may not have the luxury of any time to do anything about it. Thank you. Awesome job, everybody give it up for her one more time. All right, well, we unfortunately are at the end of our time here yes, tonight, we but we do have some people we'd like to thank. Take it away. Thank you. Uh, first, I just want to take, thank the TEDx core team. Uh, we want to say th big thank you to the communication department and the DAT program, the art department, the theater department, as well as all the student, faculty, and staff who volunteered. Also, a big thank you to Steve Baker and Laura Hartford, who helped create the iconic TEDx sign. You love it. You got to love it. And uh, big ups. I want to say big ups to uh, definitely want to give a shout out to Sean Apostle and uh, Angela Miller. You guys are amazing. Love your leadership. Big shout out to Nick and Zach on the sound team. Uh, big, out, big ups to all the guys and uh, all the women working around the clock to make this thing possible. In the spirit of Bellarmine, uh, remember to always explore the world and make sure you start within. Did we get all the thank yous out? Probably not, but anyone else we didn't thank, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Also, thank Grace Poss. This is the first Thanks, time MCing. Quincy. You got to pass the torch. I love it. All righty. Those doors are going to open, and uh, you all are free to do as you please. Head out, have more refreshments. Thank you all so much. Thank you guys again. <laughs> <laughs>